Head up to the mountains, and if the steep trails don't slow you down, the thin air will. There's less oxygen up there, so strenuous activity can leave you dizzy, out of breath, or worse. But even though you're beat, biochemical processes are already busy at work, acclimating your body. Scientists investigated those pathways in humans and mice. They found that exposure to low oxygen depletes stores of a red blood cell protein. It's called EENT1. And that's a good thing, because now other substances that protect your body against low oxygen are free to rapidly accumulate and help the body adapt. But here's the kicker. Once the EENT1 protein goes away, it doesn't come back, meaning red blood cells kind of remember their altitude exposure. And that means if you hit the mountains again soon enough, you can acclimate faster than you did the first time. The findings are in the journal Nature Communications.
climate change feels like something that's happening to the atmosphere. But most of the action is actually at sea. About 90% of the heat that gets trapped by greenhouse gases is absorbed by the ocean. So it's, it's really important to track that energy in the climate system and, and track the warming um, off the ocean. Jörn Kellys, an oceanographer at Caltech. Of course, the ocean is really big, and taking its temperature is hard. Satellites give information about the surface, and scientists have launched drifting devices that measure conditions in the upper mile of water. But researchers still struggle to collect data from the deep ocean and to detect the long-term trends underlying day-to-day -day variations in temperature. Now, however, scientists have developed a new technique that allows them to measure temperature changes across entire ocean basins. The idea dates back to the 1970s.
Over the past 50 years, more and more women have entered the workforce, and they're increasingly taking on jobs that have traditionally gone to men. Now, new research shows that the women's fathers may be having an influence on what those jobs are. Researchers from North Carolina State University and the University of Maryland examined three large surveys conducted from 1973 to 2002. More than 40,000 women had taken part. They included women born from 1909 to 1977, three generations over three quarters of a century. This broad examination of women's roles clearly showed a rise in what had been male-dominated fields, but the surveys also contained information on what jobs the fathers held. And it turned out, as time progressed, there was a distinct change. Women born in the 1970s were three times more likely to follow in their dad's footsteps. Researchers can't say exactly what this means about father-daughter relationships. Maybe dads are investing more time in educating their daughters. Maybe they're talking more about their own jobs. But dads and daughters appear to be taking career paths that bridge both the generation and gender gaps. We've all heard exercise is good for your physical and mental well-being, but a good workout can actually influence the mental well-being of others, too, because bosses who hit the gym tend to be less abusive to their employees. That's according to a study in the Journal of Business and Psychology. Researchers asked 98 MBA students who were also employed full-time to rate how their supervisors treated them by responding to statements like, my boss puts me down in front of others. The researchers also had supervisors fill out a different survey about their stress levels and weekly exercise. And as the authors expected, the more stressed out supervisors were, the more their employees felt belittled by them. But the employees felt better about bosses who exercised, whether it was yoga, cardio, or weightlifting. And just one or two days a week did the trick. Exercise didn't simply melt away the stress. Bosses who worked out reported feeling just as much pressure as their sedentary counterparts. Active bosses just spared subordinates the verbal attacks. So next time you feel like telling your boss to take a hike, it might actually be sound advice. At the dawn of 2012, computer security looks a lot like it did five years ago, everything protected by a user ID and password. But that's all set to change in the next five years. Instead of trying to remember passwords for dozens of online accounts, or worse, using the same password for all of them, more of us will rely on biometrics for protection. At least that's IBM's vision. The company recently released its annual list of five predictions for five years into the future. Among them is the belief that facial definitions, eye scans, voice files, and even DNA will safeguard personal identity and information and replace the current memorization-based approach. 
Some of these systems are already in use, but future developments will enhance the technologies, making them much more sensitive. Imagine voice and facial recognition sensors and software at an ATM refusing you access to your account because you look and sound under duress. Thinking that you, the customer, are possibly being robbed, it might even contact the police. For more info and the other predictions on IBM's list, visit snipurl.com slash predictions. Decisions can be hard. We may be haunted by the path not taken. But the best way to feel better about the one choice we do make may be to put up a literal barrier to any of the other choices. In a recent study, some participants had to choose a chocolate from a box holding a selection of 24 chocolates. Others picked from a box containing just six chocolates. Each box had a transparent lid. Some were told to just pick one and taste it. Others had to pick one, but close the lid again before tasting it. Then all participants were asked to rate their chocolate. Those who put a transparent lid back on the box immediately after choosing from the 24 chocolates enjoyed their candy more than those who lingered with the lid open, even though both groups could actually see the chocolates not chosen. Well, what about the six chocolate box? Closing the lid had no effect on chocolate rankings. The study is in the Journal of Consumer Research. The researchers say other studies show that when we start with fewer options, we don't tend to ruminate on other choices or even compare options. We simply like what we get. The practice of smoking can be dated to as early as 5000 BC and has been recorded in many different cultures across the world. Early smoking evolved in association with religious ceremonies, as offerings to deities, in cleansing rituals, or to allow shamans and priests to alter their minds for various religious purposes. After the European exploration and conquest of the Americas, the practice of smoking tobacco quickly spread to the rest of the world. Smoking has negative health effects because smoke inhalation inherently poses challenges to various physiologic processes such as respiration. Diseases related to tobacco smoking have been shown to kill approximately half of the long-term smokers when compared to average mortality rates faced by non-smokers. A 2007 report states that each year, about 4.9 million people worldwide die as a result of smoking. sound itself, there are also subtle differences and shifts in loudness and pitch. That's what tells us, for instance, whether that baby crying belongs to us and just where it's located. But according to a recent study, what you and I hear may not sound the same. Scientists at the University of Oxford are trying to understand how the ears and the brain work together. They fit ferrets with auditory implants, trained them to respond to sound, and then looked at the way their neurons reacted. It turns out that each ferret's neurons in the auditory cortex responded to changes in gradual differences in sound, but each ferret responded We specifically recruited participants from the Bolivian Amazon because these participants have relatively little exposure to Western music. For example, octaves are a staple of Western music, but Chamane musical instruments don't feature them. As an acoustical phenomenon, an octave is defined as the interval in which the vibrational frequency of the bottom note is half that of the top note. They're considered the same note an octave apart.
The Aurochs. The Aurochs is the ancestor of cattle and is extinct wild cattle that inhabited Europe, Asia and North Africa and died in the forests of Poland. It was dark in colour. The bulls had a light eel stripe along the back and the cows were lighter in colour. They also had uniquely shaped horns. In the 13th century, the Aurochs were limited to Europe and later became limited solely to royal households because they became so rare due to extensive hunt. At one point it was illegal to hunt Aurochs and this crime was punishable by death. The last of Aurochs was a female which died in 1627 from natural causes. Anyway, the punishment did not make any effect on the improvement of the Aurochs population. Our ears are highly attuned to sounds in the world around us. It's not just the frequency of the sound itself, there are also subtle differences and shifts in loudness and pitch. That's what tells us, for instance, whether that baby crying belongs to us and just where it's located. But according to a recent study, what you and I hear may not sound the same. Scientists at the University of Oxford are trying to understand how the ears and the brain work together. They fit ferrets with auditory implants, trained them to respond to sound, and then looked at the way their neurons reacted. It turns out that each ferret's neurons in the auditory cortex responded to changes in gradual differences in sound, but each ferret responded differently. Remember the Seinfeld where the lunatic in the clown costume asked Kramer if he was still afraid of clowns, and Kramer said, yeah. Well, he's not the only one. A study of hospitalized kids in England found that they positively hate clowns, which are often depicted on the walls in children's wards. Researchers from the University of Sheffield took the novel approach of actually interviewing children rather than relying on adult ideas about what kids like. They spoke to 255 kids between the ages of 4 and 16, and none of them liked clowns. According to the magazine Nursing Standard, one researcher said, We found that clowns are universally disliked by children. Some found them frightening and unknowable. With Halloween around the corner, parents are fretting over what all that candy will do to their little goblins. Well, it might just make them sweeter. Because people who prefer sugary snacks actually seem to be more... Studying birds for a living might sound like a cool job, but it's not without its logistical challenges for us land-bound animals. I had um, a northern gannet, uh, so a really large bird, breeding uh, on, on the top of a cliff. David Gremier, a seabird ecologist at the French National Center for Scientific Research. And, uh, and from the bottom of the cliff, I couldn't see what was happening in that nest. Uh, I couldn't even see whether the bird was home or not. Gremier says technology offers a simple solution. A drone carefully flown at a high altitude over, over the colony would have been really... I think the gap arises from two causes.
they don't have the background to really appreciate it. You can see what happens when they get stressed. 